Yes, welcome to the No State Project here on my YouTube channel, No State Project. Glad to be with you this April 4th, 2018 for episode 58. Well, it's episode 58 already of the No State Project here for the Wednesday stream. Glad to be with you from the Fortified Compound in Mesa, Arizona. And if you want to join me on the big show, it's 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. We'll get you on the big broadcast here today. Uh, the passcode is 2020 with the pound sign, 2020 with the hashtag. I was kind of iffy that I was going to have a call line today. So for about 15 minutes, it wouldn't accept it. So it was like right before the show. I guess actually uh, that's why I'm a little bit late for the show today because it just would not accept it. I thought we were going to have a tech issue, but uh, we did We did get it. Again, that's 218-632-9399. Passcode is 2020. You can join me on uh, Skype. Instant message me first, and then I'll bring you up on the big broadcast. I uh, was expecting a, a lot of calls today, so hopefully they're going to get in soon so we do not run out of time, which is something that we do a lot here. But uh, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of people in court, a lot of you know people trying to go against these predators for their first time. So that's what we do here on the big broadcast. We also talk about getting to a volunteer society, also addressing any kind of dissent that people may have. So if you think that what I'm saying is BS, give us a call. You know the number. And uh, we'll discuss that. If I've got my facts wrong, if I've got my evidence, you know, the evidence, the logic isn't sound, then you're more than welcome to give a call here to the broadcast and set me straight. Uh, uh, for those who are new, and there are a lot, we do things based on ethics, morality. And no, this is not one of those things where, oh, don't throw your morals down at me. When people say something like that, and you're only talking about things such as not doing any harm, you're talking about being ethically consistent with somebody's own basic moral principles. When they say something, don't throw your morality down on me. I think what they're really saying is don't criticize me. I'm too... I, I, I don't have an argument. I don't have a valid basis to justify my my ethical or moral inconsistencies. So I'm just going to say, don't throw your morality down on me. It's just ridiculous. Uh, it, it's just like trying to justify immoral or unethical behavior by saying that the one you're acting against is not a moral agent. Now, that That's kind of the, the, the whole standard line that a lot of end caps will use to justify eating meat. Well, you know, the cow is an immoral actor and they can't conceptualize morality. So I can do whatever the F I want to them. And that's really not how ethics work. Ethics are what you defining, you know, is, is a statement about your actions against somebody else or something else. So the is like we've mentioned before, you can have somebody who can't conceptualize morality. Let's say somebody who's in a vegetative state or somebody who has severe brain damage or somebody who was born and didn't get enough oxygen when they were uh, being uh, birthed and uh, they can, can't conceptualize morality either. Is it okay? Is it fair game to do whatever the hell? you want to somebody because they're in a coma or they can't conceptualize morality. It is, it is just a matter of, uh, look, it comes down to this. I can't justify what I'm doing and the harm that I'm causing. So I'm just going to make up a, a stupid excuse that they're not a moral actor, that ethics only come into play when both of the individuals involved, both of them are moral actors. No, 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 no. You do not get to write yourself a blank check to do whatever the hell you feel like and cause whatever harm that you want to do just because you say that the, that the one you're acting against is not a moral actor. I mean, yeah, you could say the same thing. That's what they used to justify slavery. Well, you know, the Africans, they not unlike the Europeans, they didn't evolve and uh, because they never winter to survive. So they didn't they, they're not as smart. And because the Negro is basically three-fifths of a person, we can do whatever the hell we want to them. We can actually own people as property. Uh, no, I'm going to call foul on that. So what we do is, is, is it is 
moral and ethical consistency and applying the principle of do no harm to everybody. And this is why the concept of government falls flat on its face. Because when you start applying moral principles of do no harm, give every man his due, uh, uh, live honestly. So the, the phrase, what is the phrase? Live honestly, injure no one, give every man his due. You know, we understand these basic principles. We don't need someone in Washington, D.C. or in Phoenix to tell us this. Uh, we don't need anyone in Ottawa to say what is right and what is wrong. They are masters at crafting things as, as, as legal and illegal, which we know if you apply ethics and morality to moral, I mean to legal and illegal, there's a big, big difference. There's a lot of things that are legal, like we mentioned on the show last week, where sheriffs in Alabama can uh, take money that uh, if there's an excess of money that is stolen funds uh, to, you know, so there's an excess uh, over what they use to buy inmates food, then the sheriff can take that home. That may be legal, but it is grossly immoral. And that's what matters here anyway. So we take the basic moral principles of right and wrong and use that in a courtroom setting or when and with a bureaucratic attack. And that's why when, when we do that, the whole house of cards comes falling down. There is no justifying it. You can say and you can argue, but Mark, the people agreed. Well, the facts are against you. Nobody agreed to whether there was going to be a government or not. Whether there was a government or not was forced on anybody. Now, you can say that a figurehead is chosen, and even if it's legitimate. You know, all, so if you go back over 200 years and research Tammany Hall, uh, elections being fixed is, is nothing new. But if you don't have a choice in whether there's government or not, it doesn't matter what form it takes. Eh, yes, some it, it, it is, you know, there's a velvet glove over that iron fist. So there's differences that way. No one's saying that there's not. Obviously, I would never want to live in Mexico. I certainly wouldn't want to live in South America. Uh, you know, but it's immoral and unethical still. It's varying degrees, just like with police officers. Are all police officers uh, looking to shoot somebody, looking to kill? Are they looking to shoot first and ask questions later? No, of course not. Because there's degrees. Is every lawyer with a black robe on a, a, a totally biased uh, uh, criminal? No. Thank goodness. Because if that was the case, this would be a much more di much different show. Anyway, let's get to calls. Uh, let's see. We'll get to calls. I uh, just want to say thanks again to everybody who supports the show. This show is actually brought to you by Bill and Dan and Don. Uh, Bill and Dan, of course, from New Hampshire. I do appreciate the continued support of the show. And I will be streaming on Saturday. Uh, so the LRN stream will be right here on my YouTube channel, which is No State Project. And uh, let's get – he's been on the show before. Uh, Wit from Gilbert, what do you have for us today? I want to continue a conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago. And may I say, speaking of gross generalizations, uh, you're always speaking about cops and what they've done wrong and when they've murdered people, of which we both agree is unforgivable. But I believe the chances of you or I or anybody you know being murdered by a cop, let alone by a school shooter, is almost effectively the number zero. I can't say there's no chance, but close to a 0% chance of you being murdered by a cop, you being mur murdered by a school shooter or one of your kids. What say you? Well, I agree that the, the chances are lower than it would be if I was not white or looked white. Uh, but there still is a chance. I've had my own run-ins with cops. I know that there was a guy named Jimmy that was going to set my car on fire to be able to get me out. And that was for a traffic stop that even the judge was saying, what in the, why were the, why was the fire department out on a routine traffic? Oh, that's because this police officer, this hometown hero was, was moments away from setting my car on fire. That's how it could, I've had my own dealings. I've been sexually assaulted by police officers. 
uh, I've had my own dealings. I've had police officers with their hand on their gun, ready to unholster that damn thing. And for the most petty things with the most petty things I'm talking about, all I did was walk and go and, and walk, go to walk in front of the bar in court and cops were r- run, running up to me with their hand on the gun. So it, you can argue percentages, but the fact is these people are part of a criminal organization. And why in the world would I even be at risk with these people for doing nothing more than asking questions or walking by the in front of the bar? Why don't you tell me why a police officer is getting is moments away from shooting me because I'm walking in front of the bar? Why don't you give me an explanation for that? And it's happened on more than one occasion. That would be one of the cases I would suggest that uh, uh, your fellow so-called uh, your fellow uh, Liberty Radio Network hosts that always like to emphasize their young men with guns, adrenaline junkies that are on power trips. I don't disagree with you that there are such cops. I should like them to lose their badge and their right to bear arms immediately because I don't believe adrenaline junkies and thugs should ever be allowed to bear arms. And I do believe we can do psychological tests to test for such creeps and thugs. Again, I know there's a system failure across many police departments in the country, but you did answer my, give me an answer to the question as effectively, it's way more than zero than what I suggested, which is effectively, I believe you have almost 0% chance of ever being murdered by a cop. But you're telling me that you've had run-ins with cops that you felt endangered. Leave aside that you're still with us and no cops did shoot you. Did one of those cops pull their gun on you? No, the the hand was always on the gun. I, 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 you have to remember, too, uh, Whit, that I was stalked by Mesa PD for doing nothing more than asking a question as a journalist at the Mesa Police Department. Why in the world would they then follow me under the impression uh, that this, this, this is what they told me, a lieutenant told me. They were doing this because they were under the impression I was a domestic terrorist. If they had actually found me, how do you think they would have approached me? The guns would have been drawn. I could have been killed. Yeah, I wasn't killed. I get that. Uh, a lot, you know, thank, thank goodness in my own life, it's always turned out very well. Uh, but these are things that shouldn't happen at all. You're and it, 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 are they, it, but this is not a, a matter of a few bad apples. Uh, I, I I have a problem here with a system that is criminal in nature. You can set up a psychological evaluation, but how? But the thing is, there is a certain type of person you would probably agree that is attracted to positions of power, and so. Uh, how do you weed out the people that the system is actually trying to get? They want people to who just, uh, you know, take orders. They want people who just give orders. They want people who don't exercise discretion. You do understand part of a policeman's job is not to exercise discretion, right? Okay. Uh, there's a lot to be had in that response to my point. And again, I've already agreed with you uh, and fellow libertarian and radio hosts that, uh, some cops are thugs and adrenaline junkies and uh, adopted the psychological test that I do believe can be uh, uh, given. That's a subject for another day because I want to respond to the other points. Again, I'm not defending bad cops. And what you say about local cops that are only 10 miles from my house, sir, and if those cops are following you around and doing unethical things like uh, threatening you, I should like them never to be cops again, and I should like them to be in jail. And if they're not already, I should like to know why. I'm not defending that. But uh, many people are new to what your line of thought, not to mention many people I know are offended by you calling uh, them a criminal syndicate and criminal gangs because the good cops I know aren't criminals. They're not gangsters. They're not thugs. They're honorable people trying to protect and to serve their community. Whether you like the laws that they enforce or not, again, is another subject. That doesn't mean they're not decent people. The people that you say are following you around perhaps misread you because are new to this no state project uh, of thought processes of yours and demonizing all of the government as being a corrupting criminal organization. 
there, I asked you before to tone down your rhetoric because you're not going to win the hearts and minds of people that we should both be going for with a, with a language that is more appropriate to the people that you disagree with. The people you're describing might actually have just thought you really were a terrorist because the way you speak. Hopefully now they know that's not the case. But if they did any of the things to you that you said they did, I don't want them in blue anymore. I don't want them carrying a gun. I want them in jail. So I'm with you on that. But I, what I actually, I, I, <laughs> what I still want to talk to you about is this notion of uh, speaking of power that you uh, labeled one of our last discussions, your program, War is a Racket. Now, we were discussing World War II. So simple yes or no question was war was World War II in your mind, of which, by the way, my dad could have been buried in Arlington in 1945, not in 1997. So I take the subject deadly serious because I wouldn't exist if he did lose his life in the godforsaken Arden Forest in 1945. Sir, was it a racket? And if it was, who were the racketeers? I believe it was a racket, and the racketeers were the people that were basically funding it on both funding both sides. And it has been proven, like the Bush family, for example, was funding both sides. Ford, I mean, the, the Nazis couldn't have done what they what, what they did if it wasn't for American businessmen and American financing. That's why, under the Trading with the Enemy Act, the Bush family, uh, a lot of their assets were seized, and eventually was given back. You've got people playing both sides. Of, of the conflict. So, and, and yes, I believe it was engineered and it was, and it was a farce. Uh, can I prove all of it? No, but what we can prove is that you have American businessmen, very wealthy American businessmen and English businessmen, you know, London uh, financiers who were funding both sides. It has been uh, shown uh, as a historical fact uh, so yeah, I think war is a racket to make more money for the rich. Absolutely. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. Okay. So uh, there's a lot to respond there. If I may give it a try, because now certainly things going on in the thirties with industrial businessmen with the lax names like Bush and Ford, Ford being especially so because he was a very anti-Semite and thought Hitler was a really cool dude. Now, the Bush family, that's a different story, and the businesses they were in doesn't imply that they intended to start a war between the United States and Germany to make a bunch of money. After all, who declared war on whom? And that uh, what you just said, by the way, uh, seems to uh, mitigate the guilt of one of the worst human beings to ever live, who actually did start World War II in Europe. It was well underway in, in the Far East, of which... I guess the businesses that you say were in it to make money off of war actually weren't funding the Japs at all. And they had no businesses with the Japs, but they could, because why? Because they actually, the Japs were already at war and already murdered millions of people. Everybody knew they were up to no good. Up until September of 1939, there were still true believers that thought Hitler was a good dude all over the world. He was the most popular, powerful person on earth at the time. And I just said popular, not just powerful. Again, what Germany did in 1939 to Poland and to Ukraine and to all the other uh, Russian satellites had nothing to do with the Bush family or the Ford, Ford family. But if what you believe is true, which of course I've heard these theories, these what I will, will call conspiracy theories because they're not true, but okay. if you want to have it out, about that we can but you I, I don't have i don't have the time we're almost halfway through the I show know, here right you're using a conspiracy theory to it's bolster not, your argument it, no the, not, well, wait well well wait a minute they were okay, whether the fact that the bush wait just just on just the bush family okay. alone is a historical fact it is not conspiracy theory it's conspiracy fact so don't say it's a theory as if it's some kind of like you're using it in some kind of scientific way that it's actually uh, 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 something that's been shown and supported by fact it has been supported by fact it's historical fact just like the northwood agreement and 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 how they wanted to uh, do overthrow the united states government uh, back in the late 30s uh, I want to address this thing you took about toning down the rhetoric. 
I made it clear just on this show already today, it's not every single cop, it's not every single judge in a black robe. However, just because you have good other what would seem like good people uh in a criminal invest in in in, in a working for a criminal organization you can have the the janitor is not going around hurting people he still works for a criminal organization there's no doubt and it's and and there's no dispute no rational dispute that what we call government is just men and women forcing uh strangers to pay them there's no so before i let you, i move on can you possibly make an ethical or moral argument for the uh, United States government, or let's say even the Arizona government, knowing that the facts are they're just men and women who force strangers to give the money. Can you make a moral argument for what they do as an organization? I'm going to have to answer that on another day because that's not a sentence or a paragraph response, but I should like to be able to respond to the points you make without being told that I can't respond to them respectfully. Again, I, but, I completely agree with you that the Bush family had business dealings in industrial size with people in Germany in the 30s. They ceased having those dealings with the Nazis once war rolled around. And not to mention, is it, is it true or is it not true that one former president of the United States with a last name Bush was shot down while flying a military aircraft and almost lost his life? Now, what kind of family would get in the business, uh, create, start a war, for racketeering reasons, and then almost get one of their blood brothers killed while commencing with their uh, nefarious enterprise of getting 50 million people killed for money. Again, I want you to reevaluate your sincerely held beliefs because respectfully, what you believe is crazy, wrong, and stupid, and you're better than that. I swear to God you are. I know you to be, I believe you to be an honorable person. You believe things that are not true. They're called conspiracies for a reason. Emphasis C-O-N, con. It's not true. You okay. believe things that are not true. You believe the worst things about your government because you don't like things that some of the gov government actors do. You're not addressing my ladder, point, though. Not on the phone. Wait, you're not. I made, I, I laid it out that there are men and women forcing us to pay them. They're for, they, they force perfect strangers. If I force strangers to give me money, I'm a criminal. So you, you, you're not going to ask. And I didn't ask you to make the argument. Now, I just asked you yes or no if you could make a, an ethical argument for what we call government. And you keep going back to this thing. Uh, I'm, I'm going there's, back to what I originally well, called in about, and then you switch the subject and then ask me to answer another point. Well, because I'm you, fine with answering your question. You, That's not why I called, respectfully. I okay. want to talk about war as a racket. And then what you what did you do? You implicated people that are, aren't racketeers and branded them war criminals and war profiteers. Did That's the George historical H. record. Bush get shot down in a military aircraft or not? I believe that that's the story. However, the idea that people okay. who are rich and powerful and, and want to maintain that power, that there is a history of them killing their own. Look at the history of the British crown. They killed their own kids. So uh, it, to me, it all comes down to power. And if their kids get in the way, they get, if family gets in the way, Abba Fungul, they don't care. I, 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 I do you have people. Do you fallacious or not? You just argued from the particular to the general by switching the subject to the British government, of which I didn't bring up. I uh, understand that. I, I, I was know, making I a point. Bad government actors. No, I was making a point about the rich and powerful, that the rich and powerful will sacrifice their own family to maintain their power. So the idea okay. that the Bush – wait, well, let me finish. Okay. The idea that just because George Bush – you know, may have been injured and in, in, in that conflict, that that somehow takes away from the historical fact that they help build the Nazi machine. There is absolutely no doubt that the Harrimans and J.P. Morgan uh, and, and uh, the, the other big players on Wall Street, that they did finance and build up the Nazi war machine. That there's no, that's not conspiracy. And I don't appreciate you Con, you can. I you, completely you, agreed with everything you already just said, and I've already agreed with it. That doesn't imply that they're war racketeers or war criminals who would send their own to die just to protect the family business. That doesn't follow. That's called fallacious logic. And no, it's not. 
I, 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 I label it a conspiracy for a reason because it is. But one of those, that gentleman, by the way, that I've alluded to is still alive. He was president of the United States. His son was even president of the United States. Yeah. Now, if there were war, if there are war profiteering, war racketeering, World War II causing uh, family, Mark, it would be my duty, not to mention yours, to do something about it. And I would make like a Mesa cop and follow them around armed and dangerous until they answered for those war crimes, of which I almost got my own father killed, which would mean I wouldn't even exist. And my mother wouldn't have seven children and grandchildren. So, sir, I don't take these issues lightly. And I'm showing you respect, even though what you're saying is complete effing lunacy, no disrespect. But I've alluded to it before that okay. my fellow libertarians that are of progressive, radical beliefs so often have the most outlandish beliefs about a government and its actors. And that's why you're called extremist and why uh, maybe a cop would follow you around thinking you're a domestic terrorist. No yeah. disrespect. Okay. But if well, what I, you say I, about Bush is right, you have a moral duty to do something about it right now. 50 million people died in the Western Front because of an asshole in, in Germany, not because of the Bush family. But if the Bush family had anything to do with it and made it happen, they have to answer for that crime. That, that's that's unfortunately not the way the world works. And I, I do have to get to another well, call. Because, but but what I'd like to do is if, if you when the next time you call, I want you to right off the bat, I want you to answer whether you can make a, a moral argument for the government and then lay out that argument so that we can discuss that. I'm more than happy to answer your question. I called in to talk about something else and you throw a different question on me instead of talking about the subject I called in about. Thanks for your time and thanks for taking me on, Mark. I hope to meet you one of these days and hope to see you do something about the Bush family doing so well and living high in the hog to this very second. When you, when you implicate them in the, the biggest historical travesty in Earth history, sir. Have a good day. Thanks. I appreciate the call. And that's not to mention what uh, Bush did in Panama by leveling uh, how many city blocks in Panama, killing how many men, women and children to get one guy. Uh, you know, there were mass graves being uh, discovered uh, more than a few years after that down there in Panama. So uh, George Bush and the Bush family, not, uh, you know, that's the nature of the system. The system protects its own. And you don't get to have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and, uh, and, and, and help build up a foreign nation's war machine without being able to pull some strings and own a few uh, people in, the, in, in, in the, the government. Because the government, since time immemorial, has always been uh, a group of men and women that took control by force and kept it and they keep it by force the idea that i could do anything other than to to you know to hold the bush family accountable uh you, you can no no it's it just like trying to hold uh the, the the people accountable who assassinated the jfk you're you're talking cia and it, it, i i have no power I don't have any power to do so much. I could just present the facts. And the reason why I, I went back was because Witt said so much, and it, I want to be able to address some of it. And I lay out a logical, lucid argument with facts as to why I say that governments don't exist, that they're just men and women forcing us to. There is absolutely no rational dispute, dispute that they're men and women, and there's no disputing that they force strangers to give the money. The question is whether you're going to excuse that and say that it's okay for them to violate such basic moral principles, or if you're going to call it what it is. It's immoral. They're a criminal organization. Doesn't mean that everyone is a raging psychopath in that organization. Like I said, you've got teachers. Teachers are part of the government. They're actually helping people. They're, they're not they're not overt criminals. The system that employs them, that pays them and gives them the, you know, that is a criminal organization because forcing people to give you money is immoral. End of discussion. If you have, you know, I shouldn't say that, but it is immoral. And if someone does have an ethical argument and think you can present a, a logical, coherent argument 
and show that what we call government is actually, as an organization, is actually moral and ethical, I'd love to hear it because, gosh, till date, no one yet. All right, so uh, let's get to our calls. So, uh, uh, we have a- area code 804. What's your name? Where are you calling from? My name is Don. I'm calling from um, Petersburg, Virginia. What can we do for you today, Don? Hey, how you doing, Mark? I'm hey, doing- uh, I recently got a template from you for the motion to dismiss. I think we spoke in the email about it. I had um, filed the motion, and um, I would have tried filed it on the um, the last, the first, the, um, the last day of court. And I was thinking that's all I had to do until the judge threw out my motion, and then um, from then on it went downhill. Well, did he tell you denied in court? Yes, he did. Yes. And what did what was your response? Did you object to that? No, I didn't object. Uh, I didn't know. I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought that once I filed the motion, that would be the end of it. I didn't. No. I'm kind of new to this. Okay. Well, I, I've never, I've never told anyone just file the motion. You know, that's patriot type stuff. That's Freeman stuff. Well, just do, just, just stamp it. Uh, refuse for cause and never show. No, no. I, I, it, you're in for a battle. Most of our things are thrown out because of the motion to dismiss. It never goes to court. Uh, but not all of them. And so you do have to prepare. That's why I, I push in the instructions and on the show. Every time I do the show, I mention about doing role playing with a script so that you are prepared in case things don't go very well and you have to defend yourself in court. Because what you need to be able to do is you need to object. Now, if he's again, for everyone who's new, when they turn around and deny a motion based on a lack of evidence, we have to object and ask if they're satisfied that the prosecution has sufficient evidence. So uh, the motion was denied. You, the judge was given uh, a free pass. He didn't have to explain himself. So what happened? Did they set it for trial? Or did they set it for pretrial? No, I appealed the decision. They found me guilty and I appealed the decision. You had a trial already? Oh, so, okay, I think I remember, but yeah. I, I want to cover the details for the show so people know what the heck we're talking about. So yes, I was in. I was in appeal when on that um, last court case. It was a. I was in appeal on that. My first appeal. You have to have issues for appeal. If if you you know you, you hear based on what you've told me, the only real thing that I remember is that because jurisdiction can be challenged at any time and, and the, the motion to dismiss was denied arbitrarily, you can deny those issues, but you didn't cross-examine a police officer, if I remember right. Right. I, I don't know how to cross-examine a police officer. I mean, what, do I, what arguments do I need to bring up? Well, it's not that you're bringing arguments. You're asking leading questions to bring out that the police officer's testimony uh, is not valid or that his, uh, he's not qualified to even testify against you because to testify against somebody, you have to have personal knowledge of the matters you're testifying to. And so one of the things that we hit, and it's in the motion, uh, it's in the discovery request, is we want to know if the, because we don't, I don't think, from my experience, no police officer has personal knowledge that the laws apply just because you're physically in Virginia and that you violated them. And, and that's what we're focusing on. We're focusing, everything we're doing in court is we're focusing on the police officers and the prosecutors arguments against you. So you just want to ask questions to, to get them to verify that their claims are true, or it'll come out that they're not and they can't verify it. And if they can't verify it, then the judge is supposed to do the right thing and, and toss it out. So I do have a script that goes into a lot of the questions uh, that we're asking, depending on, on uh, what particular issues are involved. Uh, so that's why the role playing is so important. Why I push that because, uh, you can't argue a denial of cross-examination because you weren't prepared to do a cross-examination. And it's not that you, and, and typically Don, you don't have to ask more than a few questions to get them to actually impeach their witness and say he's unqualified. You don't always have to be the one to say the witness is not qualified. The prosecutor will actually do that for you, but you have to ask a, a number of questions to bring that out. We have to get them to confirm that, he did make legal determinations against you. He did determine the laws applied and he did determine you violated them. Those are not statements of fact. Those are uh, legal conclusions. It's probable cause. And then we have to ask him, well, now that we've confirmed 
that the police officer made those legal determinations against you. We need to know what evidence, if any, he relies on to prove that they're true. Well, officer, what evidence do you have to prove that just because I'm physically in Arizona or Virginia that your laws apply to me? The prosecutor is the one that will object to his own witness, the same that you did prior to this cop being put on the stand. He's not going to stand around and he's not going to argue, we don't have to prove the laws apply. He's not going to do that in a cross-examination because they're usually not that stupid. Those stupid things are reserved for my criticism and to gaslight anybody who may want to challenge these predators in court. They save that garbage for us outside of court. But I can pretty much guarantee on cross-examination, they're not going to be objecting and saying, Your Honor, the witness does not have to have evidence of to support his legal conclusions. They're not going to do that. Okay, so I need to get the script. Well, if you've got another, yeah, that would certainly help. But for right now, I mean, you're looking at having to perfect your appeal. You're looking at, at, at having to do an appeal brief. If this is, if you don't get a, a new trial order, which you're probably not going to under these circumstances. So where do you think my next steps will be? Because I appealed it to the, um, the state appeal court. So. Well, what you have to do is you have to put together an appeal brief. Now, I do have a template for that, but yours is going to be even shorter than most of ours is going to be because you don't have all, you know, you don't have a denial of cross-examination that you can raise. And that is one of the big issues. Denial of, of a fair trial because there was no evidence of jurisdiction because he denied arbitrarily the motion to dismiss. Yeah, it's a pretty solid issue. It's not a home run or a grand slam, rather, uh, like you have with denial of cross-examination. And, and denial of cross-examination is probably the worst error a judge can commit. And that's why we, you know, why we focus on it. Well, we focus on it, too, because it's, it's so easy to get and it, it's so predictable. I could sit here on the, on the show and let's say you were having a trial tomorrow. And I can, um, I can guarantee with like 99% certainty when you ask those two questions that I just went through with you here on the show, when you do that, 99% of the time, I'm absolutely certain that that prosecutor is going to impeach his own witness. Okay, that'll come in hand because I do got another trial coming up in two weeks. Oh, okay, did you file the motion to? Okay, did you also file the motion to dismiss and the discovery request for that one? I'm going to do that tomorrow. My trial is on the 18th. Okay. Well. Yeah, because I, I think the mistake I made this um, the last time when I filed the motions on the same day of court. So that might have been a big mistake. Well, look, the bottom line, yes, you should be filing it as soon as possible so that they don't have an excuse that the prosecutor needs to be able to respond. Uh, that wasn't why the judge denied it before, because, you know, he, you know, he just outright denied it. Uh, they're supposed to, they're, what I'm saying is if they want to use that excuse, they defer their decision until the prosecutor has responded instead of just outright denying it like you did. But for, for, when, for those who are new, well, you have to uh, assume that everything the judge is saying is a lie. So if he's going to okay. deny the motion, you want to object, ask him a leading question. Don't just say, oh, what grounds? Don't give him the opportunity to give you a narrative if he's inclined to do that. So how, what did I say when I just say I object? Well, you say objection. You? Yeah, you say objection. Are you So your position is the prosecution does have sufficient facts. Okay, okay. Because the motion to dismiss is based on a lack of facts, a lack of evidence. So if the judge is going to deny it, his position has to be, if it's going to be a valid determination, it has to be he disagrees with you that the prosecution does have sufficient facts. So what do you think about it? I need to do about my other case? I would when file I appeal, all the appeal. Okay. Yeah. Well, with the appeal, you have you can email me off air. I'll get you a template for a brief. It's all going to be based on the motion to dismiss that was denied arbitrarily. You're just going to have to show that in the brief that the judge did it arbitrarily. You know it's arbitrary okay. because there's nothing in the evidence. There's nothing on the record to support the judge's finding. If 
the prosecution had evidence to prove the laws apply to you because you were physically in Virginia, it would be in the record and the judge would just be able to say, ah, it's right here. Yeah, like I said, I asked for the evidence. I asked for the um, what laws did I break, what crime was committed. I got no response. Well, I, they should have at least told you, well, sir, on the ticket, you're violating, you're accused of violating section such and such. Uh, but as far as the evidence, yeah, if you're asking for evidence to support the prosecution's claim that just because you're physically in Virginia, their laws apply, yeah, of course you're not going to get a response. And you need to object and say, this is why I have a whole video about pleading guilty. It's to throw a monkey wrench in this. I will plead guilty today if you can show where the prosecution has met their burden. No, I mean, okay. That's why the role playing helps with that. But you, you understand okay. there's the basic principle is that we're holding the prosecution, the accuser to their burden. And we're not going to accept any of this crap that they can argue without evidence. Okay. Now, how, how do we know okay, that they're not permitted, that fairness and due process does not permit an, a party to argue without evidence? How do we know that's true? There's honestly no evidence. Yeah. How do we know it's 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 unfair, even by their you know, okay, well, how do we know that that's unfair to argue without evidence? You gotta have evidence for a case, right? Well, what I'm saying is how do we know that how do we know that it's unfair to argue without evidence? What why do I always say that? Where am I getting that from? I'm totally lost. <laughs> okay. The the reason why their own rules of fairness, they're trying to say that you're entitled to a fair trial and all this and fairness. Fairness means that the rule, there are certain rules that apply to both sides. Okay. That there's not a rule that only applies to you in practical application. It's exactly what these animals do. Okay. So the issue of not arguing without evidence is a fairness and due process issue. It's also in their ethical rules, uh, rule 3.1 of the attorney's ethical rules. They're not permitted to argue anything without evidence. And okay. And the thing is, if it, it, I, I talk about this all the time, Don, if they say that the prosecutor doesn't have to prove the very foundation of their case, that they, so we ask them, so you're saying that you're going to allow the prosecution to make a legal claim against me with no evidence. Yeah, he does not have to prove the laws apply. And then you can object and say, objection, do I get to make legal claims against the prosecutor without evidence? And what that is doing is bringing out how unfair it is. Because I can tell you right now, there's very few things that I'm absolutely certain about. I am absolutely certain that no judge in Virginia or anywhere else is going to allow you to make legal claims against the prosecutor and the cop without evidence. Not going to happen. You will be punished, and you'll be punished swiftly and severely. Mm -hmm. So the question turns... So they, so they can't use the speeding ticket as evidence, correct? Well, the speeding ticket is not evidence. The speeding ticket has an okay. allegation. There may be statements of fact on the ticket, but do those facts prove their basic claim that just because you're physically in Virginia, that the constitution and laws apply to you. So you you've got the ticket to do any of the facts, which really are just your physical location. Okay. But do any of those facts prove that the constitution and laws apply to you? No, I wouldn't think so either. And I've spoken to many a bureaucrat over, over these years, including a Supreme court chief justice. Uh, so because of that, He's arguing without evidence. They also need to have a witness with personal firsthand knowledge. And so this still gets back to the basic premise of everything we do here on the show is to get the accuser to validate and confirm that their claim is true. You want to know why does the police officer think the laws apply to you? You want him to tell you that. And the best he's able, well, you're in Virginia. Okay. And how does that prove your constitution applies to me? So my question would be towards the police officer, not the um, prosecutor. Well, it depends on where you are in the proceeding. So on this, what's happening on the 18th, if that's a trial, uh, uh -huh. you're yeah. going to initially be putting the questions to the judge for the prosecutor. And then if they okay. if they ignore that, or if they railroad you, uh -huh. 
then you're going to be putting the questions to the police officer on cross-examination. And I'll say this every show if I have to. Cross-examination is your opportunity to challenge the witness and their, their competency and their credibility, what they've testified to and whether they're competent to do that and whether they're credible to do that. Competency and credibility are not the same thing. And they are fair game on cross-examination. This is why good lawyers will always, even fair lawyers, will always tell their client, never, ever, ever, ever take the stand. Ever. You may be completely innocent, but there may be things in your background that will come up that will destroy your credibility and your toast. You're better off not going on a stand at all because it's not something they can then necessarily bring up. And plus, a lot of people can't survive cross-examination. Uh, good lawyers, good cross-examiners can really tie them up. I don't try, I don't think I fall into that category. I think I'm a good cross-examiner because I stay on point and I ask good leading questions. And I know my subject matter backwards and forwards, and I've got a lot of experience doing it. Uh, so the reason why I'm effective on cross-examination is because I'm challenging somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. So like I mentioned, the police officers are making these legal determinations against you. So if you're on cross-examination, everything that happened at the stop is fair game and part of a cross-examination. Just like if he has ever lied on the stand before, it's Brady material. If he has a history of lying on the stand, that has to be, uh, that has to be disclosed to you. But you can ask him point blank on the stand. Have you ever lied under oath and, and been caught in any other proceeding? Or you could just ask him, have you ever lied under oath? Have you ever lied on a police report? These are all parts of a cross-examination. Now, they'll tell you prior to uh, the trial that in Brady, places like California, they don't have to give you that information. They don't have to give you the information in the file. It's privileged. Or it, it, by law, they don't have to get. But once he goes on the stand, that's a, that, that's a perfectly Legitimate question for cross-examination. Have you ever lied on a police report? Yes or no? Okay. Does, does it also, does it have anything to do with type of court I'm in? Uh, you know, look, th this whole thing about this Freeman stuff, hope we can avoid that. This, this idea that you have to be in a common law court, not a statutory court. None of that has any merit whatsoever. They have their statutes and this, this idea that statutes are law. Statutes are color of law. I don't know where anyone gets that crap from. I don't know where you can point to something and where there's any historical value to, to that at all. Or have, I hate to say it, are there any court cases that say where they actually agree with you? Well, statutes aren't really law, sir. Statutes are just color of law. And if you're smart enough and you can catch them, oh, gotcha. So uh, to me, it doesn't matter necessarily most of the time how they're framing the type of court it's in what i see is important is whether it's common law administrative uh, maritime admiralty it all boils down to the same foundation you're within our jurisdiction because of the constitution and the constitution is the constant with all of them so that's the foundation and that's what i think is more important to hit anyway okay OK, so definitely get a, um, a script and do some role playing on the No State Project Skype chat. OK, no doubt. <clears throat> OK, where did I get that script from? Oh, you can go to get that right where you got the motion to dismiss. Just at uh, Mark okay. Stevens, markstevens.net. Okay. OK, I will do that. All right. And, and keep in touch. Let All us right. know if you have any other questions and what we need to do to make sure that you're prepped and ready to go to court. All right, then. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the call. I've got uh, Don in Virginia. And, uh, you know, if you're new to the show, and I know we got we, we, we always have new people listening to the show, uh, going into court is not ever to be taken lightly. Uh, you may not walk out of there under your own power. You could get a forced psychological evaluation just for asking questions. So I want to discuss with the time we got left here on the show. Uh, it's very simple. Don't ask the same question over and over and over again. You're not going to persuade the judge. If he doesn't, if he's not going to answer the question or if he's not going to answer it the right way, you got to move on. If you ask the same question over and over, they're going to use that 
as the basis for a psychological evaluation. And someone's posting here, statutes only apply to state-created creatures known as corporations, and they're given a Supreme Court case, uh, Colonial Pipeline versus Triangle. Um, I seriously doubt that's what the case actually says. So, you know, you could do a search for this online very easy to confirm that. And, and I'm pretty certain that's absolutely not what that case says. So I'm actually going to look that up. And I'm going to make sure I've got the entire case here. And that's the beauty of, of the Internet and using a the computer. There's a search function. So I can take your what you say is a quote and I can plug that in and see if they actually say that. So I'm going to I'm going to copy that. Statutes only apply to state created creatures. Give me I'm telling you that's absolutely not what the case says. So let's do a copy. I'm going to paste that into the search tool and let's see what we get. Did the Supreme Court of the United States actually say that? Let's take a look over here. Oh, what a shock. That's that's not what the court there's that No, that's not what That is not what it says. Let me get uh, It's just like that legislative enactment uh, uh, or the uh, someone who years ago had a thing, a uh, preamble citizens are not subject to legislative enactments, completely fabricated, just like this. It is not in this. No, absolutely zero. The phrase statutes only apply to state created creatures is not in this Supreme Court case. So that is a fail. Colonial pipeline versus tri triangle 421 US 100 absolutely does not say that uh, uh, this crap, that statutes only apply to state-created creatures. Not true. Uh, absolutely not true. So, nope. Uh, and so there's a big one right there. A statute is not law. Uh, let's see if we can find this trash. See, that's the thing. you got to look this stuff up. Can you imagine the Supreme Court writing something like that? Don't you think that it would be posted all over the, you know, it would be on the news? All right, let's do this. A statute is not law. Let's see if that is in there. A statute is not law. So we're going to we're going to do a search for that. A No, it does not say a statute is not law. That's it's nowhere in this case. Uh, so that that's two of them. This is so important. People put this stuff out there and they put it in quotes as if it's true, and it's not. I just made two. I, I'm gonna have to put this in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, not true. So this stuff that you're quoting here, this Joshua guy. You're quoting stuff that's not true. I just did the search. I, I spent the time on a live broadcast doing that. Not true. But I can guarantee when you go to my work and I have something in quotes, you can co look that up and it will be in there. So, uh, no, you're dead. No, I just did a search, Joshua. You're 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 wrong. You're you're wrong. Um, and all right. So well, I'm almost out of time here. Uh what I mentioned before, I made a, a point here. I wanted to make sure that I uh, discussed this uh, before the show was over. I, a lot of the stupid things that we'll go through in the role playing and that we discuss here on the show, the stupid responses we get, we typically don't get the really stupid things and the serious gaslighting crap in court. I have never heard a prosecutor in an effort to stop a cross-examination uh, that was extremely damaging to their case. I've never heard them come out and actually say that, that he doesn't need any actual evidence to support his claim of probable cause. 
uh, because one, they almost never address the fact that I'm asking for facts. Prosecutors lie through their teeth and the judges allow them. That's the thing. You know, the judges are working for them and bailing them out. When you ask what evidence, if any, do you realize, uh, do you rely on to prove that just because I'm physically in Arizona, your constitution and laws apply to me? Their objection is that it calls for a legal conclusion when I'm only asking for evidence. A, an honest judge would have said to the prosecutor, and I'm warning you, sir, if you object so off point again, I'm going to sanction you a thousand dollars. The man just clearly asked for facts. He's not asking for a legal conclusion. And by the way, here's a clue. The police officer's job is to make legal conclusions all effing day. He cannot do his job without making legal conclusions. Do you really want to go on record and say that your own witness is not qualified? We're working here together, you idiot. I can't possibly make this look good if you're going to shoot both of us in the foot. So the gaslighting crap is usually saved and usually done by critics or when we're outside of court. Are you crazy? It, what, what did? That what I said was crazy. It was wrong. It was un, crazy. No, I'm not crazy for questioning things. I'm not crazy for looking at the evidence. And I'm certainly not crazy because I demand that people, when they make a claim, give the evidence, especially those types of people that I can't just walk away from. But I want to warn people about this stuff that's on the chat, the, the YouTube chat. It's not true. Statutes don't apply, only apply to state-created creatures and corporations. That, that I, I, I can't... Uh, see, and I don't have to resort to gaslighting. You say, what, are you crazy? All you do is you cite where it, you look at it, you verify it's wrong, and you say it's wrong. I don't think this guy Joshua is an idiot. I don't think he's crazy. I think it would be crazy to use it in court. I think it would be crazy, well, ill-advised anyway, to use that stuff without verifying it first. Oh. So again, before I end, you know, the, the gaslighting stuff is just reserved for us outside of court. So that's something that I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of because uh, I want, just like what I did with wit, it's going to be a regular part of the show and, and, I, and I'll be posting videos if I get any, uh, if anyone will speak to me, that problem is not going to go away. That is only getting worse. Um, calling and asking bureaucrats if they, just like what I did with, with Witt and Gilbert, can you make an, a moral or ethical argument for the organizations we call government? I don't think you can, but I want to give people the opportunity. And so hopefully if the next time Wick calls, instead of going on about World War II, we're going to get right into that. If he can make a moral argument for government, I'd love to hear it. And if you're listening and you think you can make a moral argument for government, you're welcome to call the broadcast. We're totally out of time here, uh, but definitely streaming live on Saturday so you can join me on the Saturday show. But this has been episode 58 of the No State Project live from the 40. support, excuse me, of the show. And uh, uh, again, I will be live on Saturday. So till then, suffer.